Mission achieving NDC targets through clean cooking action. As we all know, cooking is a is a emission costing source. Uh, it's a, also one of the blind spots within the climate action area. And nearly two. 2.5 billion people lack access to clean cooking and it's causing about 2% or more of the emissions but uh, the situation has not changed much over the last decade and then latest IEA projections also show that even in 2030 with the business as usual approach we will still have 2 billion people without access to clean cooking solutions by 2030. So it's, it's a big uh, blind spot that way in the climate action area. There are many reasons and there are also many opportunities to solve it compared to the past. There are many climate finance instruments, there are carbon market instruments. They have shown uh, that it is possible to show uh, support, some innovative projects and then which can be scalable and uh, impactful. Uh, but there are also many other uh, problems to resolve. We have an excellent panel today to discuss all these issues. And uh, uh, I will hand over to Doni Alexander from Clean Cooking Alliance, who is the um, Senior Director and Chief uh, Science and Learning Officer to introduce the panel and introduce the topic. Over to you, Doni. Thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you, gosh, thank you. And we have a wonderful panel today. Sorry. Um, uh, it's too bad there aren't very many people in the audience because we have such a great panel today. I want to start off by introducing the panelists and then we'll get right into the topic. First, next to me, we have Mr. Hans Olaf from, he's a special envoy at the Ministry of Nor um, the Nor Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Next to him, we have Prince Essel. He's the co-founder of EcoNexus Ventures Limited. We have engineer Irene Batebe from Uganda, the permanent secretary. And we have our own Jeline Connors Belopowski from Clean Cooking Alliance. She is our chief of staff and external affairs. So as we, as we heard, we are not on track to meet SDG 7, especially when it comes to cook, cooking. And I think one of the things that is so important is to think about including clean cooking in the NDCs. And this is something that we have worked very hard on with UNFCCC and others. We see that right now about almost 70 countries have included clean cooking in their NDCs. But what does that mean going forward? How do we actually deliver on those commitments that we have put in our NDCs? So I want to turn it over to Irene. Why has Uganda prioritized clean cooking in its NDC? Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, thank you very much. I'll try to compete with the background noise. Uh, so as a country, uh, we did set our targets in terms of clean cooking in our national development program that runs for five years. And uh, in that program, uh, we did set a target of achieving clean cooking to 50% by 2025. So for us to meet that target, it was important that in the NDCs, we do capture clean cooking as one of our areas of emission reduction, uh, given the benefits that we shall achieve from meeting the target. Today, we've been able to push this to 15% and are putting in place interventions to enable us achieve the 50% target. So we are looking at an array of solutions when it comes to clean cooking. Uh, we are promoting LPG. For us, we call this a transition fuel. We are saying on a way to a renewable energy future, the role of liquefied petroleum gas will play a critical function in achieving our target as we promote e-cooking and other solutions. Uh, we've been very deliberate to put in place regulations for biofuels and we are fostering an ethanol solution through ethanol cooking stoves and others. 
So biogas also remains an important intervention on our side in achieving that target. Uh, today we are working with the African Biodigester Project under SNV. Uh, we've so far installed 7,000 biogas digesters and we target to install, to double that number within the next three to four years. And uh, working with the World Bank, we are also looking at interventions in terms of clean cooking technologies. Uh, we have support from the Clean Cooking Fund and the Clean Technology Fund uh, to ensure we are able to invest up to 30 million US dollars to contribute to this target of 50% clean cooking by 2025. Thank you, Irene. That's really interesting. And as you, as you were, um, as I was speaking, actually, Dr. Kande Yonkela came in, and he is the um, founder and CEO of the the Energy Nexus Network. Thank you, Kande, for joining us. You served as the first leader of SE for All, and have witnessed the evolution of clean cooking and the inclusion of clean cooking into energy access. Um, around the world and in, in low and middle income countries. Since you began your work in this sector, what progress have you seen and what do we need most to move forward at this point in time? Thank you very much. Happy to be on the panel with colleagues. Sorry I was late. Um, we've seen major progress in the following sense. We now see a discussion of clean cooking in many places which we didn't have five years ago, 10 years ago. Many places, meaning at the highest level at the UN, in a number of countries, as you say, 60 to 70 countries, have now included some aspiration in their NDCs. We see also a discussion by countries like Uganda, Kenya, and others, when they discuss electrification, they discuss clean cooking at the same time. Uganda, Kenya, uh, Nepal, uh, Bangladesh, I've seen that transition. However, it's still a handful of countries, 10, 15 countries that are discussing clean cooking as they discuss energy access strategies, electrification plans. The rest of the developing countries where the need is, I don't see that yet. We also have to take note that the NDCs, what I have seen in, the, in these sections on clean cooking, they are aspirations. I know a few countries, I asked them, so how did you set your target? Mm -hmm. They said, well, we had a discussion and we decided we want to make it 50%. <laughs> no modeling, no simulation, no planning. So my point is, no data. So my point is now we need to come to that question, what do we need to do? We need to translate those aspirations to policies, strategies, programs, projects. That's where you get the action. That's where you get the traction. Perhaps even helping with some planning to see whether those targets are realistic or how long and how it will take countries to achieve them. So we need support for a number of countries to be able to translate their aspirations into real actions. For that, we need a critical mass of people within those countries that are champions of clean cooking. A number of African countries I know, they will tell you, we want to deal with greed expansion. This is not a priority. And you're trying to say, but it should be integrated in your electrification plan. Cooking loads. Look, our poverty is now becoming urban po poverty. If you look at the trucks entering Lagos, Freetown, Abidjan, uh, Bamako, the cities are becoming the graveyard for the forest and the charcoal. That's where we're going now. I have people in my constituency who rather make charcoal than farm. They're cutting the trees. They make money because the trucks are there to take you to the city. So developing an electrification plan for cities, it is imperative that we integrate in that plan the cooking loads. How we encourage utilities like we see in Kenya. It is the utility that is encouraging now the spread of electric cookers to save their forests but also just the reality of the, of the health hazards and the other problems of lack of access to clean cooking. Of course, we need finance. Yeah. We need regulations. So there's quite a bit of action that is needed now. But number one, political prioritization. That clean cooking is as important as electrification. 
and we plan for them together. You had so many points there, and I actually want to get to several of those. You talked to really at first about uh, d just making targets and throwing, you know, pulling things out of a hat, basically, and, and needing the support to help make robust plans. I'd like to first go back to Irene and then go to Jaleen, because for first, Irene, you talked about having a plan that includes LPG, biogas, ethanol. It is something that brings in several options for people. How did Uganda go about making its NDC plan? And then after that, I'd like to go to you to Jaleen to talk about the work of 4C. But Irene, I'd love to hear from you. How did Uganda go about this when they were thinking about their NDCs and clean cooking? As part of the process of arriving at our NDC plan, uh, aspects to do with measuring, reporting, and verification of emissions became very critical for us to have an informed plan. So with the support of the Clean Cooking Alliance, we were able to go through that process and have an idea of the emission targets uh, that we seek to achieve and therefore embed those in the plan. Uh, but the other aspect was consultative, having all the relevant stakeholders on the same table and just discussing and deliberating on what we seek to attain as part of our NDC uh, targets. Uh, but uh, just to add on to the role of stakeholder engagement as part of this process, in one of those sessions, no one would understand why clean cooking was being given priority. And as already indicated, the focus was on grid expansion, connectivity, and uh, clean cooking. Everyone says, you're already cooking. Why are you making this a priority? Uh, so we had to keep clarifying on that level of deforestation, the need for us to really reduce on the level of uh, cutting down of trees for fuel wood and charcoal, but also our targets in terms of emissions. So it was a consultative process a lot of awareness creation to just have the buy-in of the different stakeholders. It sounds like uh, Uganda is doing it right in terms of the inclusion of clean cooking because it, you need so many, can you guys, so many stakeholders involved in this process because it, is, because it crosses so many different aspects of our lives, starting at you know, deforestation and forest degradation to health to gender, to youth. And so bringing in those stakeholders is really important. Jillian, we talk and heard her, uh, Irene talk about the, f the support that the Clean Cooking Alliance has provided in helping governments develop their NDC targets for clean cooking. I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about this consortium that we are in and the support that we have been providing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think as Irene was indicating, when there is appetite to include clean cooking and NDCs, it is a daunting and overwhelming and complex task. And we were hearing from our country colleagues around the world that there was a lack of guidance on exactly how to do that. And there were tools and frameworks and things that were missing that could provide really valuable support to coordinate and scale these efforts. So the Clean Cooking Alliance joined with partners including the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, UNFCCC, Berkeley Air Monitoring Group, and the Stockholm Environment Institute to initiate what was something called the Clean Cooking and Climate Consortium, which we call 4C for short. But it is a consortium designed to provide just that, the technical assistance, the guidance, and the frameworks to support governments in creating ambitious clean cooking strategies as part of their NDCs, and then moving on to implementation. So we work with a consortium and a range of partners around the world to support NDC development, planning, and implementation in various ways. And so the first phase was really working on helping countries include or strengthen the clean cooking related targets in existing NDCs. And we're pleased to say there's 67 countries now that can include an aspect of clean cooking. The next phase is really working with those countries that have done so and helping them turn that into implementation plans. So what we've learned, they really, really need support in determining the baselines, measuring fuel savings, identifying data collection parameters, 
all those invaluable aspects of monitoring, reporting, and verification that Irene was speaking about. And so we've been providing support on multiple levels. We've published a, an MRV framework and an implementation roadmap that are available to anyone on our website. And we have been conducting a series of deep dive workshops to provide more targeted assistance to those in country that are working to develop and implement these plans. And we continue to partner with the consortium and others to provide any support that's necessary. Thank you, Jalene. And I, I want to go back to Conde's comment from the beginning is, you know, we need technical assistance, we need to bring people together, and we need financing. So I'm going to turn it over actually to Hans Olaf now and to talk about how is Norway, a donor country, supporting, um, supporting these efforts to, to bring to fruition clean cooking to meet the SDGs and the NDCs. Thank you very much. Uh, before uh, sort of going into some of the details related to the question that you asked, I would just maybe provide some introductory remarks. Of course, this is the problem from my perspective, but it's also the opportunity because there's a huge market out there. There's uh, one out of three people in the world lack access to clean cooking. So turn this around and make an opportunity rather than a problem, but we are all faced with translating what we state in our plans, the NDCs, into action. So the question is, what will it take? Um, and also, for me, I've always been grappling with whose problem is this? Because that also applies to, to, uh, to what extent we as donors give priority to it. Is it I'm working on energy. Is it my problem or is it my health colleagues uh, problem or is it since I'm doing also climate is it my my climate and myself's problem and I think we need to start looking into this. Um, it's one gigaton that we can reduce through it. So I think actually maybe we should now focus a little bit more on the climate side of this coin. A question then how many of the national statements that have the leaders gave few some days ago included clean cooking. I, I don't know, but I think that would be extremely useful to get an overview when you have three minutes uh, of a statement. How many included the word clean cooking? But I think Conda, you also said it, and that applies also to my leadership. And the question is, how can we get high level commitment to this agenda? How can you make a political career of, out of supporting clean cooking? In the sense, I think most politicians, even though I'm a loudspeaker here, but I think most politicians have an ambition to become prime minister or president. How can you become prime minister or president by focusing on clean cooking? That's probably a tall order, but I think that is something we should be aiming for. In Tanzania, just as an example, the president of Tanzania convened a meeting 3,000 people, all the ministers were present, Prime Minister, she instructed them to move forward. And now, of course, the question is how can we translate her political commitment to clean, clean cooking into action? And we'll probably see the answer to that in a few years' time. And then, of course, we need to develop all the strategies, we need to set all the targets, and we need funding. We were the launch donor for the Clean Cooking Fund set up by the World Bank ESMA program in 2019. So far, I don't know how many donors has shipped in, but at least we paid up first uh, together with uh, the Netherlands. But there's hardly any other donor that have actually stepped up to the plate and provided resources to this. So this is a common challenge that we are all faced with. and I'm. I'm faced with a challenge. I was just with a minister and I told her I'm going to a clean cooking event now. And she was really grateful that I attended this event because this is something that she would like to, to give priority. But I still need to convince our development cooperation agency and the rest of her colleagues to really make this into a key, key priority. So I think I'll, for me then it boils down actually to Conde's point, we need our politicians to prioritize this. A short caveat also towards the end that access to clean cooking fuels is not really correlated with economic growth. 
sometimes I'm saying in any terms of access to electricity and access to water cynically speaking we can lean back and wait until the economic pro uh, growth will take care of the problem but access to sanitation and access to clean cooking will not be solved only by economic growth other uh, we need to find another way of addressing it but like a previous minister asked me what is the model Hans Olav and then my response was if I had had the model I would not be sitting across from you I would be somewhere else but I don't have the answer thank you Thank you. <laughs> That's a, some very good points there. And one of the things that we need for transition is the technologies in place. We cannot transition people if we do not have clean technologies. The next person that we have is Prince Essel. You co-founded a company called EcoNexus Ventures. Can you tell us a little bit about this company and how it commercializes sustainable, sustainable biofuel and ways to energy production and how that fits in with this picture of clean cooking? Yeah, thank you very much. Hello, yeah, so, um, Econexus Ventures is a social enterprise uh, based in Ghana. So what we do is we produce um, sustainable bioethanol fuel and then we sell um, the fuels along with the stoves. So I, I must say that um, in this transition, um, as we all agree or as we all know, that technology has a critical role to play in that. But oftentimes, uh, for us innovators or for us um, entrepreneurs in this space um, we don't really have um, much access to capital to drive this kind of transition I'll use myself uh, as an example how I'm, I was able to build this startup from ground zero from 2019 to date it has all been grant and um, up to 4th of November um, last Friday I had only raised about $18,000. $18,000. It's not like I'm doing something that is outside what like, um, we are doing. It is something that is very important. But, and these grants that I've raised were only um, geared towards some peculiar thing in, the, in my business uh, operation. So you will get a donor giving you funding for process equipment. Then they forget they forget that as a business you need working capital now you have the process equipment and you can't do anything then now the entrepreneur has to now look for other programs other grant opportunities and for these programs it takes roughly six to eight eight months you go through training after that then they will make a decision whether they will fund you or not that is six to eight good months of um i mean time that you have wasted you understand for all through this um, um, training so for me what what I, I i believe is that should we have the funding then we would need to have to scale the technology we need to now think about catalytic funding for entrepreneurs in the space it is not about five thousand dollars if it's not about ten thousand dollars we need to be very intentional about coming up with innovative funding more like seed, seed capital to drive um, the, the industry. For me, I believe that, I mean, I like what um, Irene said on um, bioethanol. It is fair for most countries to think about going LPG. But I think we, we will have to be, um, I mean, in addressing this, we, we should have a tailored-made approach. You know, if you say you are targeting um, LPG distribution in rural communities. The technology is good, but I must say that the uptake or the, the market segment is, is not that developed to take the technology in the sense that most rural communities are not even more trouble. How do you distribute the gas to them? That's where biofuels comes in. And biofuels are portable, you understand? And most communities are even island communities, last mile people. You understand? So I, 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 I want to urge each and every one that, I mean, it's not about generalizing the clean cooking goals. It is about making it tailored-made. I mean, with the technology um, in mind. 
you know, we, we need to be intentional about that. Because um, for a whole bio for, I mean, I was actually speaking to some Indian partners coming to this meeting. We're discussing some distillery because we are trying to put up a distillery to support our um, distribution. And what they told me really, um, it was really profound that up to date, India has over 1,000 distilleries, over 1,000 eternal distilleries. And I must say, one distillery, maybe we'll have an average capacity of 30,000 liters per day. It can provide jobs to about 10,000 people. This is, the, this is the potential biofuels can give. Yeah. You understand? And almost, even in my, my own country, the clean cooking plan has biofuels uh, eliminated. And it's really sad. My, my country is looking at ICS. I mean, I feel that when we look at this, we look at it at a short-term goal. ICS for me are short-term, but it has a lot, a lot of like long-term consequences. Because at this age, if we are promoting ICS, what you are doing is that you are asking people to go cut down trees. Chaco, for ICS, once we have the arable land that we can implement biofuel technologies, yeah. you know, so, so what I'm hearing, Prince, is that we really have to look at our market segment, right? And see yeah. what the appropriate options and, uh, you know, are for our customers and really do and understand our customers in the different contexts. Yeah. I think one of the things that countries have struggled with is just this, right? Understanding what the actual market is. Um, and one of the things that we've started to do at CCA and in work with Condé, they, uh, do you want to do take it? it Conde there um, with uh, is is setting up a delivery units network we, where we can support country governments in really digging down and supporting them on these very issues: segmentation of the market, understanding what the baselines are, understanding what trajectories they can take, and supporting them. And I would love to hear a little bit more about this Conde because there's so much to these delivery units. And tell me, how do you think that they can support country governments in meeting their NDC goals? Well, the delivery units will be a set of experts that are entirely focused on clean cooking issues. And this is not strange. In, in a number of African countries, sub-Saharan African countries, you have economic units set up in the Ministry of Finance, Central Bank and Revenue Authority by the World Bank over the last 30 years. And also in some of the uh, ministries of energy, you have people seconded there that are experts in electrification planning. We believe you need a core set of people in the countries to help the ministers design their policies, design the strategies, do the market assessments that they need to make clean cooking a real issue. In some cases, some ministers will tell you, okay, Kande, we agree, but we don't have the data. I need a paper to go to cabinet. Who can help me put it together? Because my experts, they deal with hydropower and uh, uh, transmission lines. I know it's an issue, but I don't have the requisite skill set to be able to do that. But as I said, if 70 countries or so have made it a priority in the NDCs, they're going to need this technical capacity to move forward to make those actionable. But in countries where there is progress, Uganda, Kenya, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, what they are looking for now is scaling up. You don't need to convince those leaders. I mean, in Rwanda, President Kagame himself leads this issue. The Kenyans have been doing everything right. What they're looking for now is real solid climate finance. Yeah. They have companies. In Kenya, they have Coco, they have uh, uh, Burn and others who are doing very well. But they need capital to scale up within Kenya, but also in neighboring countries. And that's where climate finance comes in. And I know with technology again, there are those now, like with electric cookers, even with the, the ethanol burners, they can put a chip in so they can really document actually how much greenhouse gas avoidance can be, can be yeah. generated so they qualify for voluntary carbon markets. So it, now in those countries where progress has been made, you still need that expertise on the ground. But also supports to those entrepreneurs like him who are venturing in. This is not an easy thing to do in the country. I mean, Ghana, I know 15 years ago we had other entrepreneurs that I used to take to New York to showcase 
After a while, they told me they were not going anymore. They say we showcase, but we're still at the same level. We've not been able to expand. We cannot access finance. We know we can deliver these stoves and other solutions to two, three hundred thousand people, but we're still stuck at thirty thousand. So the expertise on the ground is crucial to 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 put the right technical documents together, to do the adequate planning, but to be at the table, more broadly speaking, to be at the table when they're discussing energy access. Yeah. And all its dimensions. To be at the table if the Ministry of Energy is trying to discuss problems of deforestation. Experts are there to say, hey, here is how clean cooking, lack of access to clean cooking is contributing. Or for that matter, in the case of Ghana, they said to us, we need people with the Ministry of Finance to help us with carbon finance. We're and people from those countries, right? And people not from, from those countries. Not from not America or anywhere else coming in. People from those it's countries. It's building the capacity local. Exactly. Building that capacity local. Yeah, and you talk a lot about financing. I'm going to keep on that for a little bit. And I think, you know, as UNFCCC has gone through this process the last several years with Article 6.2, with where you can have a decentralized funding mechanism from a donor country to a recipient country, or Article 6.4, I think we're really starting to see that there's going to be a lot of movement in this space. Another one such mechanism is the GCF. And so, Hans, I want to go back to you because this is something that you have been involved in is the GCF. And can you talk about are there any clean cooking programs or do you see a future for clean cooking as part of the GCF portfolio? And, and what makes a good, I mean, what is appetite, like, you know, what would be of interest? Thank you. Um, I'm actually the, is it working? Yeah. What? Is it working? I, it, it sounds like it's working. I'm the second, second uh, standing member of the board, of, board member of the Green Climate Fund. So I've been uh, on the board now for almost five years. Um, trying to promote uh, quite regularly clean cooking. We are now in the process of developing a new strategy for the fund um, that will uh, kick in as of next year. So it's part of the replenishment process. So of course I would encourage all of you to to submit uh, the issue of clean cooking uh, to us uh, whenever there is uh, an opportunity to do so because that will of course decide uh, how we're going to support this issue. The fund has already supported several clean cooking programs in Bangladesh, Kenya and Senegal just to, make, uh, just to mention three examples. What we need to is that we have the capacity to prepare good proposals and that was uh, presented here from my, my colleagues on, on the panel and the GCF uh, has a readiness program that will help to build the necessary capacity because we need to build local capacity to be, prepare programs that should not be done by a group of consultants jetting in, jetting in from abroad because that's not the way to move forward. So the capacity building issue is quite important. It's quite complicated procedures. And um, again, uh, I'm going to put the blame squarely on myself because of these complicated procedures, because when I'm pointing at someone, there's always three fingers pointing back at myself as a board member, and I've not heard a single board member from a developing country wanting more policies uh, <laughs> or regulations, but it's all come from my side of the table. So, so this is a a shared problem that we are faced with. We tend to overload all these mechanisms with a lot of policy requirements and procedures. At the same time, having said this, I'm also accountable to my taxpayers. And then I, I need to make sure that we are spending the scarce resources that we have wisely. That mentioned the finance and we have the one gigaton and, and the carbon market, of course, for the GC, be quite critical, actually, that you clarify the, the um, uh, climate impacts of the various interventions, because the Green Climate Fund is a climate fund. So it's climate first, co-benefits second. I think sometimes we've forgotten that, and maybe we have co-benefits uh, first, uh, or, or we have benefits first, and then uh, carbon benefits second. But it is a climate fund. So we need to clarify the climate uh, uh, benefits of 
each and every intervention. And then, of course, also to make the case in terms of uh, other co-benefits. But for, uh, for us, I think it's also important to state that even though it's a complicated procedure, the current ED, Yannick Lemarek, who's unfortunately leaving uh, sometime early next year, has actually to taken significant steps to harmonize our, the process. And he has then made sure that uh, the project cycle time now has gone down from 24, 26 months down to about 12 months. But there's still more work that needs to be done. Thank you. Thanks. And I think that's a really, uh, as he, he said, we should be looking at country at the readiness fund when we're just thinking about it, and then the larger GCF funds. Because I think there are significant opportunities out there, but if countries are given the capacity building and are, are given the support and are able to deliver, if they have the right units in place, this is going to be something that we can really tap into. I wanted to turn it back now to the permanent secretary. Um, well, <laughs> And again, you're, uh, Uganda has been one of the countries that 4C has worked with a lot. And we've had such a pleasure of working with um, Uganda on your process of looking at monitoring and verification of your indices related to clean cooking. Can you talk about how you're tracking progress in your country on clean cooking? And what resources um, outside of 4C do you need to successfully measure and track progress and understand those impacts and, and how is Uganda doing that? Yes, uh, with the support of the Clean Cooking Alliance, like I had indicated earlier, uh, we have put in place systems to help us monitor but also measure, verify and report on our emission reductions and that informed our process for arriving at our NDCs. So we continue to track that. We are able at any one time to track uh, the emissions that uh, we are, re the emission reductions uh, from different technologies, but also uh, collecting data to enable us inform our investments. If it's going to be investment in clean cooking, what is the baseline data? We are able through these tracking systems to have this data to make such informed decisions. And we've just applied that uh, we are working with the World Bank to structure a fund that is supposed to support us in uh, scaling up electricity access. And one of the aspects was on clean cooking. And uh, for us to arrive at that uh, particular portion of about 30 million US dollars to support the clean cooking endeavor, we had to provide data uh, to convince the bank as part of our negotiations uh, for that project. So that speaks to the need for nations to be able to access such data, track it, but also use it in making these investment decisions, but also in negotiating funding to be able to continue scaling up our clean cooking solutions. So we continue with that endeavor and uh, strengthening our tracking systems in terms of measurement, but also verification. And uh, the issue of internal capacity then becomes very important. At least as the Ministry of Energy, we've ensured we are training, but also building our capacity. We have teams that are dedicated to aspects of clean cooking. So when you come to the ministry, we have officers on a day-to-day -day basis that are working on aspects just looking at clean cooking. So that has enabled us to ensure that we are able to track and monitor our emission reductions arising from clean cooking. Yeah, and that really should be a model, I think, of how we move forward with countries. I mean, Uganda is really, Uganda, is, can you hear me? No. You can? Okay. Uganda really is ahead of the game in this, and I, I really commend you because a lot of countries are still at the space where they know they want clean cooking, but that's really kind of it. So I want to turn it to Jalene a little bit, one more time to say, you know, we talked about the delivery units a little bit, but can you go into a little bit more detail on kind of the pillars or the value add of how we are going to put this into action and how we're going to provide that support to countries in detail? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's very clear that there's no time to waste and that 
countries shouldn't be out there on their own trying to figure this out independently when there are so many learnings that we are getting and there's so much finance out there and there's so many avenues port but to figure out what's out there to figure out what you need what you don't know to plan costs money we were talking about this this morning honey planning needs funding data needs funding and so the idea behind the delivery units network was to provide a mechanism where we could support multiple countries in developing pathways and clean cooking transitions that best fit their local context so it's driven by country pull it's driven by national self-determination and which transition pathways which mix of fuels and solutions work for those countries and they're in the lead but we through this coordinated mechanism and by connecting multiple delivery units in different countries are able to share learnings, provide access to catalytic funding, that type of funding that you need for a specific pilot project that you can't get access to for a budget or to develop the studies and the data that you need to access GCF financing. And also to build capacity, as Hans Olaf was saying, we want people to make a career out of clean cooking. We want clean cooking in all levels of government and adjacent agencies and in the sector to be a viable career pathway. So how do we create good jobs, jobs that people want to be in, they're proud to serve in their ministries and their agencies and build that capacity so we don't need to parachute in external consultants to provide expertise. There's expertise everywhere on the continent in these countries and we need to provide them with the opportunity to lead in a role where they can showcase and develop their talent and share it with others. So there's the element of capacity building, professional development, and really ultimately that peer-to-peer -peer learning. We know what works in Uganda may not work in Sierra Leone, but there could be similarities and where do we get enough information and enough data where we can see the different archetypes of countries, see where different cohorts of countries are on their journey, and try to accelerate those journeys together. So we're not out on our own doing this. We don't want to come back next year and say, we still have clean cooking in 67 NDCs, and each country has 20 different plans, and none of them are funded, and none of them are coordinated. We want to fast track that. So Clean Cooking Alliance and partners are launching the Delivery Units Network. We're actively fundraising for it. We've signed letters of intent with four countries so far, Sierra Leone, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, and Kenya, in conversations with Rwanda, Tanzania, Uganda, and others. And the more pull we can demonstrate from countries that are actively leading on this and that are asking for the support, the more we can leverage international donors, development banks, and phil philanthropic funding to say, we need that funding, we need that money to help plan, to help develop these strategies, and ultimately leverage the other finance in the ecosystem to turn these plans into action. Thank you. Um, and I think that was a, a really good description of, of what a delivery unit will look like. We also, I, uh, before we, we close the panel, I wanna go one last time to Prince because Again, we cannot do any of this. We cannot get to clean cooking access without the companies, right? If you do not have solutions within a country at scale, we don't have it, like if there's no supply chains, if there's, if there's no companies that exist, we will not get there. And so one of the things about your company that I think is so interesting is that it is a biofuel, looking at ethanol. I would love to hear a little bit from you about the, the penetration in Ghana and the user experience because that is so important at the end of the day. There's no climate emissions reductions without scale and without adoption, right? You can have everybody have LPG or have ethanol in your homes, but if you're not using it, you're still at the same place we were before. So I think that's one of the key pieces to think about here and I'd love to hear a little bit from you about what are the user experiences? How, how is that going in Ghana and what advice do you have on getting people to adopt these clean cooking um, technologies that may not have been kind of in their repertoire before. All right, so um, we started off with a um, World Bank um, proof, of proof of Concept grant. And last year we did uh, a pilot study with Africa Center for Energy Policy. And 
based on the food um, experience or based on the validation from the food, we realize that a lot of them, uh, a lot of our users are looking for alternatives. Um, those who are making, now making a transition from LPG are doing so because of price fluctuations with LPG. And even with the fuels and then the stove, the only um, challenge we had was distribution and supply. Because you give the stove to them, and the next thing that is recurring is the fuel. So then they, they come to you asking you, where do we get the fuel? And operating at this scale, now it comes back to us, how do we drive the supply to them? Then now the issue of having retail or depots in these communities become a, a viable option. But now it also comes down to capital. Because already you have, they have a, a feel of the uh, produce, um, the, the product. And then everyone, everyone cooking with the ethanol, they, they, they are assured of high level security as against LPG. Because with ethanol, what happens and when, when, you even, um, when you even expose it, the only thing that you lose is your fuel. You can do the same with LPG, you know. And we, we, put, we actually distribute the gel and then the liquid. So it, 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 it's more of like um, user friendliness. They find it very like, um, okay, very good to use. But the question now is, where do we get it when we run out of fuel? You know? Yeah. So um, my, what we've done in bridging this is that we've actually, um, we, we saw clean cooking as a community. You know, you cannot deploy clean cooking solutions without like, or with only throwing the solution or the product to them. So what we did was that we created community-based energy clubs, which were actually made up of women. And an amazing thing was that in one of the communities, we started with only 10 women joining our first community energy um, um, society meeting. And the next meeting we had, that was the next quarter, we had about, the number grew from 10 to 250. Whoa. It was crazy. And that is why we, we, we realize the, the, the value of recommendation and referrals. So we use these women clubs to educate them about clean cooking with the emphasis on ethanol. And we do demonstrations. We've done several cooking competitions, even in, in these communities. The idea was that we wanted them to have a first hand experience with the cooking. So we come, we, we align up the communities, we engage them. Um, a, a cooking competition, then we crown the winner, stove, and then the fuel. You know, so we had to go to the grassroots because what we are promoting is a grassroots fuel. It is a bottom-up kind of mod to tackle it from grassroots. And we believe that doing that um, will, will actually give us the numbers and also create the impact. So we are growing uh, our community, our community energy clubs to more um, other and we, um, we seek to have this community coming on board to drive the um, company at the grass. I truly believe if there are options available at a price point that people can afford in a way in which they can afford, in a location that is convenient for them, women will transition. We need to make it easy for our customer base so that people can transition and not make it challenging. We need to meet the customers where they are and that sounds like that you've done that very well. I'm gonna close the panel here with one last question um, to each panelist, starting with you, Jaleen, and we'll come back to Hans over here. We know that funding is the biggest issue. That is not a question. That is the biggest issue that we face. But if funding were not an issue, if it were not, what would it take for us to achieve these clean cooking and climate goals? Jaleen, we'll start with you. I think what it really takes is coordination across all of these spaces. We've talked about health, climate, energy, environment. We need, at the top level politically, we need agendas and budgets and ambitions to be aligned. And 
holistic integrated responses. We cannot be tackling electricity access here and not incorporating clean cooking loads. We can't be trying to protect forests over here and not addressing the underlying drivers of charcoal collection for cooking and heating in homes. We can't be looking at food security and not thinking about changing the way people cook that food. So at the highest levels, we need to align our sustainable development and climate agendas and make sure that our plans and our budgets are working together. Equally, at the grassroots level, on the ground, where enterprises and organizations are working, do the same thing. Where can we connect access to energy projects, clean fuels with regenerative agriculture, with nature conservation, with biodiversity, with water and sanitation, so that we're addressing the holistic needs of people. Let's not forget these are not numbers, this is not data, we're not ticking an access box. We are trying to build resilient communities, landscapes and societies, and we can only do that if we think of all these issues affecting people together. We need government leadership. Energy markets all over the world over the last 100 years have been created by governments. In, in, the, in this context, for, for an industry as fragmented as clean cooking, for an issue that touches women, children, forests, health, you need government leadership to create the markets, get the right public policy in place. You need public capital, local and international, that will leverage additional private capital. Concessional financing will also be crucial, but government leadership to create the markets is going to be crucial. Thank you, Kande. Permanent Secretary. Yes, in addition to the right leadership, I believe that uh, a focus on aspects of access, reliable electricity, but also affordability will remain critical for attaining our, our clean cooking targets. Uh, because, uh, like I indicated, for some of these countries, you might have the demand, but uh, without electricity, your e-cooking targets cannot be attained. So, together with a coordinated and holistic approach, there is need for integrated energy planning to ensure we are planning in a holistic manner, but also conclusively to achieve our clean access agenda. Access, affordability, reliability. Okay, thank you. And again, with, with, if we had the financing, what would, what would we need to get to energy access for all? Yeah, so if money is not a problem, what I want to see is scale up or scaling of the technology. And in scaling up to, we need to be very intentional about local production or localizing the technology production. It's very important. If nothing, if we've not learned anything, then the global pandemic has taught as a lot of lessons about um, local production. So we, we need to have the, scale, the scaling of local um, solutions, and it's very important. We, we, we also need this capital to move barriers to entry or market development. We need to um, move the barriers that um, these solutions into entering into market. Um, that is uh, outside the policy and all those things. These are grassroots kind of implementation or, or what do you call it, action that we need to take. Thank you very much. Thank you. If money is not an issue, which is always is, uh, anyway, gotta, so think about it. then uh, I think the problem would have been solved, but you still, of course, have to address the issue of technology and capacity. Uh, just a small caveat on LPG, and I, from my own perspective, I think it's, uh, I cannot support my colleagues that say no to LPG. I cannot afford that because this issue is too important to... We cannot just say no because it emits a few kilos of CO2, in my view. So we need to include LPG as one of the solutions there. Because the most important thing is to, to clean up our kitchens. And if I had spent more time in the kitchen, I'm quite sure I would have done it. Uh, quite fast and given priority to this issue. So, but having said this, I think it's important because funding is a matter of prioritization and Kande, you said it also, to, to get the political leadership to buy into this. 
we have to make the case because I think our colleagues that make funding decisions are pretty rational. We get the funding we deserve. And if we don't make the case, then we will not get the funding. And if we get funding, there will be less some other col to less to other colleagues. And that's something we also have to be mindful of because the cake is normally uh, in one size and we <laughs> can all try to make the cake bigger. But if we get a slice of it, then that means another colleague will not get the same slice. Thank you. Thank you. And I really appreciate that comment on LPG, especially as we look at the data. Transitioning from baseline to LPG is a climate win because baseline is so dirty in most cases. When you're using charcoal and you're transporting charcoal, transitioning to LPG is cleaner. And we cannot say that just because we think we need a cleaner environment that you and other countries cannot transition and have a, the, the ability for a just transition of using the fuel of your choice. But I want to repeat here because we had some really good comments at the end and I think it's really important. We need better coordination. We need to have coordination among the actors in this space and have dedicated focus going forward. We need government leadership, both within the low and middle income countries where this is an issue, but within the donor countries as well. We also need the reliability of that access. So we need to have the sense that we have reliable access and we need more local um, technologies and more technologies to ensure that we can meet the demand. And finally, we need to have the capacity and also be able to make sure that we are getting the political pri prioritization. We are making the case for clean cooking. So really an excellent panel today. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much.